God left it up to us. Thank goodness he doesn't leave it up to us because he's not finished with us yet if we're still here. Got things for us to do. You may have pulled up and saw yellow caution tape. The fireman called it caution tape. I was afraid it looked like crime scene tape. But um, we got we had a telephone pole out front that held a street light over our street sign, and it's been bent really bad. It's old and been bent for years. I called Georgia Power a few years ago to try to get them to replace it, and they said it wasn't there. But we're paying them for the street light, so. The fireman, I called the fireman because there's wires on the ground, but it, it turns out they're just guide wires. They're not hot. But he still, he even told one another fireman, don't step on that, you just never know. So we got this entrance over here. Make sure you use this entrance over here. Hopefully they'll replace that pole this week. I'll follow up with them tomorrow, if not today. A little funny on my phone says this man standing here and he says my wife just turned to me and said I was talking to you and you yawned six times am I that boring and it, he said those were not yawns those were six unsuccessful attempts to speak <laughs> I'll get in trouble if I'm not careful why my wife says I stay in trouble Today we're going to finish up our eight-week sermon series that we began the first week of January, How to Live in the 21st Century. So today we're going to talk about fulfilling your life mission. This will be the, the end of the series. We'll wrap it up and we'll move on to something else next week. So we've been in this series about living in the 21st century or living in 2024. It's much different than it was just a few years ago. We've looked at how you need people to live with, you need your church family, you need power to live on, you need principles to live by, how you need a profession to live out, and today we'll look at how you need a purpose to live for as we conclude this series. We've talked a lot about purpose during this series. We call it your life mission. Uh, everybody's life mission is unique. He calls us to different avenues of ministry and different avenues of, of things to do. I think I see a Georgia power truck pulling up out there now, hopefully, um, and so forth. But what God, everybody's life mission is unique. What God has called you to do, what he put you on earth to do is like no one, only, only you can fulfill your life mission. Think about that. Only you can fulfill it. The moment you become a believer, the moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, God has an assignment for you, and that is called your life mission or your ministry. Uh, many of the parts of your life mission are unique, but there's one part of your life mission that everybody has in common. We all have this in common. It's that God wants you to tell other people about what happened to you. He doesn't want you to keep it a secret. He doesn't want you to keep it to yourself. He wants you to tell other people what's happened to you. He wants you to share your testimony, uh, your lifestyle, your witness, the good news. And if you're a Christian, if you're saved, if you're on your way to heaven, then you have good news. You have a wonderful story. The Bible says it like this in Acts 20, 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. These are words of the, uh, from the book of Acts. Once I know Jesus Christ, part of my life mission, not all of it, but a major part of it, is that I invite other people into God's family. So there's four points to today's message. Number one, my mission is to invite other people into God's family. My mission is to invite other people into God's family. You do this by witnessing to them, talking to them, telling them about what happened to you. You can also invite them to come to Shadner First Baptist Church on Easter Sunday, or any Sunday for that matter. Jesus said in John 20, 21, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Uh, what has he sent us to do? In Acts 1.8 it says, And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem 
and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Uh, this is a very, very important verse. In fact, the church was founded on this verse. This verse not only tells us what we're supposed to do, it tells us where we're supposed to do it. Uh, first it says, you will be my witnesses. Well, what does it mean to be a witness? I, have you ever watched a court case on TV? I'm sure you have, whether it be a, a real court case or, or a make-believe one. We've, we've all seen court cases on TV. A witness is somebody who shares from personal experience. I saw this or I heard that. Witnessing is simply sharing what God is doing in my life. It's not being a theological expert. It's not being a pastor or a preacher. It's just sharing what God is doing in my life. And we can all do that. God wants you to be a witness. Some people think that, well, that's what preachers or pastors or missionaries do. Uh, they're supposed to tell others about Christ. Actually, if you think about it, you are a far better, more effective witness than me. You're far more effective than I will ever be. People will expect me to talk about Jesus. When I talk about Jesus Christ, they say, well, you're just a paid professional. We expect you to talk about God. On the other hand, when you talk about God, what God's done in your life, you are the satisfied customer. Think about that. You are the satisfied customer. Now, who has more credibility? Of course, we're all to do this, but people will listen to you more than they will listen to me. You are the authority on your life. Uh, nobody else can share your witness or your story. If you don't do it, that's the part of the life message that God has for you that will never be heard on this earth. And, and that's a tragedy. If you don't say it, nobody else is going to say it for you. Uh, we are to be witnessing, sharing what God has done in our lives and what's happened to us since we became believers. Now, where are we to do it? It says in four places, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in every part of the world. What does that mean? Am I supposed to get on a plane and fly over to Jerusalem to share my faith? No. Remember, when the disciples were hearing these words from Jesus, they were in Jerusalem. So here's the point. Start where you are. Start where you are. Where's your Jerusalem? Your family? your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, that's your Jerusalem. You start with the people closest to you. You start where you are. You don't have to go somewhere else first. You start with the people in your own sphere of reference. And then it says you go to Judea. Judea was like uh, the county. Uh, what is our Judea? South Fulton County. Or some of us live in Coweta County or Fayette County. It's like our county. Uh, is there anybody here in this county or in your county that needs to hear the good news? Of course there is. There's a lot that need to hear the good news. And then it says you're to go to Samaria. That's kind of like the county next door. But the Samaritans were culturally and ethnically different than the disciples. So the point here is the third place you go is to people of a different culture or language or ethnic group than you are. People of all kinds of different cultures are now coming to Georgia. Uh, you don't have to go very far to go to your Samaria. It's right next door. There's your Samaria. And then it says, go to the ends of the world. For hundreds of years, Christians couldn't do that literally because there wasn't the transportation that we have today. But in fact, for many years, they didn't even know that the world was round. <coughs> but today, going to the ends of the world, that is a legitimate opportunity that everyone in this room could eventually go to. How do, how do you do that? With the internet, with social media. Uh, you can go all around the world from your own home, and you can share your faith. So what's my mission? To invite others into God's family. Number two, what am I supposed to share? Here's your message in two words. Good news. Good news. That's what we're called to share, good news.
Mark 16, 15, says, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Let me ask you this. Do you like to get good news? Everybody does. Do you like to share good news? Most, most people like to. In our household, sometimes we compete to see who gets to share the good news. It's, it's fun sharing good news. And I know what some of you may be thinking, the people that I work with, my friends, my neighbors, they're not interested in the good news. But we're dead wrong. They are. They're not interested in religion, but they are interested in the good news. The problem is not that your friends and neighbors and co-workers aren't interested. The problem is you and me. The problem is you and me have forgotten how good how good the good news really is. And that's a sad commentary if you think about it. Sometimes we forget how good the good news really is. Once you've been a Christian for a while, you forget how miserable it was to live without hope. You forget what it was like to worry about when you die, where you're going. You forget what it's like to live without purpose, to have guilt and fear and regrets and bitterness in your life before Christ brought meaning and purpose and significance. What happens is the longer you're a Christian, the more you tend to take for granted how good the good news really is. Sometimes I tell the Lord, God, I'm spoiled. I'm, uh, you've spoiled me. Uh, uh, you've blessed me so much, we just take too much for granted. We're spoiled. Uh, if you go out here and just talk to people on the street and say, how do you get God to love you? Here's what 95% of the people would say. They would say, well, you've got to work real hard to get God's approval. And you've got to be really good. You've got to keep a lot of rules. And you probably have to follow a lot of regulations and do some rituals. You've got to be a religious person. Most people think it's really hard to get to know God. But the good news is it's not. The good news is when you, when you get right with God, you get to know God, not through rules and regulations and rituals or religion, but through a relationship that's based just on trusting. It's just on trusting, just having faith. Romans 1.17 says, For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Not by being perfect, not by never sinning, not by keeping a bunch of ceremonies, not by, but simply by trusting Him. Now that is good news. It's so simple, uh, no one could say it was too hard to understand. You just trust Jesus Christ. You have to have a childlike faith. When I trust my life to Jesus Christ, there are three incredible, fabulous, wonderful benefits in my life. And this is what you need to share with others. When you tell people what it means to be a believer, it does three things in your life. If you're keeping notes, there's, there's three things in your notes. When you tell people what it means to be, be a believer, these three things happen in your life. When you trust Jesus Christ with your life, three wonderful things happen. He takes care of your past, your present, and your future. Number one, first I get forgiveness. First, I get forgiveness for my past. If we were to take everything that you've ever done or said or ever thought and make a movie out of it and show it to everybody, you'd be really nervous. And you'd probably be pretty embarrassed. And so would I because nobody's perfect. Everybody's made mistakes. Everybody has skeletons in their closet. Things that they wish had never happened. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting man's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. God comes along and says, when you trust Jesus Christ with your life, I take that movie and I rip it up. And I burn it. And I take everything you've ever done and I wipe the slate clean 
and the screens are erased. It's a blank, a blank screen. It's like starting over with a brand new life. Isn't that good news? I know a lot of people walking around in depression from regret and guilt and shame in their life. Even if there were no such thing as heaven, it would be worth it just having a clear conscience. Number two, he takes care of the present and he gives me a purpose for living right now. He gives us a purpose for living right now. God has created you for a purpose. You're not an accident. You're not here just to take up space. But you're never going to know God's purpose for your life until first you get to know God. That's the first step. Trying to discover why you're here and where you came from. None of that is going to make sense to you or anybody else until you know God. When you get to know God, you're going to know who you are. When you figure out God, you're going to figure out yourself because God made you and God made you for a purpose. People are all the time saying, well, I'm just trying to find myself. You probably aren't going to like yourself once you find yourself. They say, there's something missing in my life. God's what's missing. And you weren't made to live and go through life just on your own power. Uh, until you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, life isn't going to make sense. That's why Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I came so that you might have life and have it to the fullest. He didn't say, I've come that you might have religion. He said, I've come that you might really live. Why? Because you're not living until you know God. You're not living until you know the purpose that He made you for and begin to fulfill it. Until then, you're just existing. You get up in the morning, you eat breakfast, you get dressed, you go to work, you come home through rush hour traffic, you watch TV and go to bed. And you repeat that over and over. Uh, maybe you relax on the weekends and you go on vacation or two and you say, I'm living. No, you're just existing. You were meant for far more than just your job. You were meant for far more than just making money. God has a mission and a purpose for your life, but you never, you're never going to know it until you get to know Christ. And that's what's sad watching people who don't know the Lord stumble their way through life, not knowing which way to turn and which way to go. The third thing is you get a future. You get a future, and that's a home in heaven. A home in heaven. It's God's retirement plan, but it's more than that because you're not going to retire when you get to heaven. There's going to be more stuff, good stuff to do. So God says, I'll give you a home in heaven. Most people hope that they're going to heaven, but they're not sure. Hope isn't good enough. Uh, this, is this is too important to not know for sure. Most people in their mind think that the way you get to heaven is by being good enough. And if you do more good in your life than you do bad in your life, then maybe God will grade on a curve and say, okay, come on in. That's the wrong answer. It isn't going to work that way. You're never going to get up into heaven on your own power because you're not good enough. The Bible says that heaven is a perfect place. Think about that. There's no sorrow in heaven, no suffering in heaven, no sin in heaven, no evil, no bad in heaven. It's perfect. So that means only perfect people get to go there. If he let imperfect people into heaven, it wouldn't be perfect anymore. And that leaves me and you out. You're not going to make it into heaven on your own efforts. Forget it. Don't even try. You're not going to get to heaven on your own efforts. There's only one way that you get into heaven. And that's on somebody else's ticket. And since none of us are perfect, God came to earth in human form in the person of Jesus Christ. He became a human being and he lived a life of perfection. He showed us how to live. He gave us the example. He died on the cross and paid for our sin and then went back to heaven. And now you get to get into heaven on his ticket if you trust him. Romans 6.23 says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift. Circle that word 
gift. That means you can't earn it, you can't work for it, you can't own it in any way. It's just a free gift. God said you get to know me just by trusting me. And if you trust my son with your life, you get forgiveness for your past, a purpose for living in your present, and a home in heaven in the future. Isn't that good news? That's, that's great news. That's wonderful news. Do you think anybody you know would be interested in that? Satan has fooled us. We think that none of our friends or the people we've worked with, our neighbors, are interested in hearing the good news, but we're wrong. The world is hungry for good news. They're searching. They're looking for something. Uh, there's a great spiritual hunger. The good news keeps sounding better and better because the bad news of the world keeps getting worse and worse. Just to flip on your television or pick up a newspaper. T today's, that's the message, good news. Why should I share it? Why should I care about the people around me to tell them how to get into heaven? What's my motive? Number three, love. Number three, love. The motive for your mission is love. Love for Jesus and love for other people. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ compels us. It launches us. It motivates us. It changes us. It motivates You can't be the same after you uh, experience the love of Christ. And everybody matters to God. God has never made a person that he didn't love. God made some people that we don't love, and God has made a, a, a lot of people that we don't even like, but God loves them. The most despicable person that you can imagine, God still loves them. If you're here on this earth, that means that God loves you because he made you, he created you. That means we must care because God cares. When when you express love for people, it builds a bridge. It opens a door to share the good news. Recently, I heard that Jane Roe had become a Christian. Jane Roe, the famous abortion case, Roe versus Wade. She was the test case. Uh, a few years ago, she became a believer in Jesus Christ. And as she was telling her story, you could see how her heart had been softened. And she had become a warm, caring, loving individual. And it dawned on me that one person who showed her love and attention, shared the good news with her, one loving relationship did in Jane Rowe's life what all the protests in the world had failed to do, change her mind. You don't change people by protest. You change them by love. And you do that one life at a time. Uh, that's the only way you can change society, one life at a time. We love the people. God has put people in your life specifically that He expects you to share the good news with. They're, they're in your life so that you can share it. You are the only Christian that some people might know. If you don't, your, if you don't share your story and the good news, who's going to do it? Am I responsible for that person? No. Is the person two seats down from you responsible? No. You are responsible for that person. God holds you responsible for the people that He puts in your life to tell the good news. Family, friends, relatives, the people who you come in contact with. Many of you say, well, I'm kind of afraid. I'm afraid to, to witness, afraid to tell the good news. 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8 says... For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as prisoner, the Apostle Paul, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. So the antidote to fear is love. The reason why we don't share the good news is that we don't love people enough. We don't love them enough to want to get them into heaven. It's, if we love them enough, we'd want to tell them the good news. If 
if I see a building burning down and one of my kids is in that burning building, I don't care how big the flames are, I'm going in after them. I don't care if I get hurt or not. I don't care what other people say about me. I'm going in. They say, you're crazy. I'm still going in. I grab that child and I bring them out and I may be singed and burned. And then people would say, well, you were brave. No, I wasn't brave or courageous or crazy. It was love that motivated me. And because I love that person enough, I am going to go in and save them from the flames. And when you finally love your friends and your family enough, you're going to tell them about Jesus. When you finally love your family members, your father, your mother, or your brother, or sister, aunts, uncles, who don't know Christ, you finally love them enough, you're going to have the courage to tell them the good news. And, and God will help you do this. He'll give you the power to do it, the courage to do it. It's not like you're trying to give them a deadly disease. It's not like you're trying to sell them some swamp land in Florida or get them involved in some racket or con job. You're telling them the greatest news in the world. Forgiveness for the past, power for the present, and a home in heaven for the future. So I want to challenge you to get serious about sharing the good news with the people God has put in your life. Is there anybody going to be in heaven because of you? Number four, the last point. How do I do it? How do I fulfill my, my message? Here's the, here's the method. Two things. You've got to show it and you've got to share it. Show it and share it. Remember, remember back when we were in school? Can y'all remember that far back? I'm, I'm starting to feel that way myself. Well, remember in school, show and tell? Uh, that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to visualize it with your life, and He wants you to verbalize it with your mouth. Show and tell. God is looking for audio-visual Christians. Walk the walk and talk the talk. Demonstrate it and communicate it. That's what God wants us to do, both. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So, so you and I need to be an example of God's love first. You need to live in a way that demonstrates God's love. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You demonstrate it. You show love. You let it be your witness in that way too. If you've ever been in court or served on a jury or watched a case on television, you know that the number one tool of a defense attorney is to discredit the credibility of the witness. If he can discredit the credibility uh, of the witness, then the case is thrown out. Like I saw this, but he's a drug addict or he's lied in two previous cases. Uh, don't you think Satan's trying to do that with you? He, he wants to discredit your lifestyle so that other people will say, well, if that's a Christian, forget it. The fact is, you are being watched. You're being watched by your boss, by your neighbors, your co-workers, your children, your relatives who don't may not know Jesus Christ. How you live is influencing where they're going to spend their eternity. Please understand how high the stakes really are. Every conversation you have, every action you take, every word you speak has eternal implications. I shudder thinking that one day someone might use my life as an excuse for saying no to Jesus. I've seen how he lives. If that's a Christian, forget it. Well, we're talking about life or death here, eternal implications. It's not just your life. You will influence all kinds of people around you by your lifestyle. And you need to show God's love and live in a way that brings credit to God's name. But not only that, I need to tell it. I need to tell it. Tell the good news verbally. Colossians 4, 5 says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. And it's just not enough to live it. You have to go and tell. 
Some people say, I don't need to tell people. I just live it in front of others. My witness is my life. Do you realize what an ego trip that is? Even Jesus had to tell them how to be saved, and he was perfect. You say, well, my witness is my life. That means you just walk in the room and people look at you and fall flat on their face and repent and accept Christ. I doubt that's going to happen. You've got to tell them, be an audio-visual Christian. Your mission is to invite people into God's family. We can sit on the sidelines and do nothing and wait this one out, or we can get involved. So who is it that God has brought into your life that's around you that God expects you to share the good news with? Take advantage of the opportunity that God wants you to use. Psalm 67 2 says that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Invite someone to come to church with you next Sunday, or especially on Easter Sunday, or share the good news. Say, do you, do you, give, me, give me a couple minutes to tell you about what God has done in my life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come together to worship you and look into your precious word, Lord, and to be challenged to, to share the good news, Lord. You have been so good to me and everyone in this room. And sometimes we overlook it or we our, our memories are short, Lord. If we think back to what you've done for each one of us, Lord, number one, Jesus came and laid down his life that we you've given us not only eternal life, but abundant life in this lifetime. And Lord, I just pray that we would all be more faithful in sharing it with others that we rub elbows with every day. And that we'll invite them to church this Easter or, or next Sunday. And, or that we'll just tell them the good news on our own, Lord. And, and just tell them what happened to us. Anyone can lead someone to the Lord if they're saved. Just say, tell them what happened to you when you were saved, when you trusted in Christ as your Savior. And Lord, we just thank you for saving us and for all that you do. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Greg, if you'll stand with me, we'll sing our invitation hymn, which is Only Trust Him. It's hymn number 317.
cancer that spread in several places. Uh, so pray for him. For him Sam Jones. Sam Jones, a, a friend of what? Uh, brother in law. Brother in law, okay. All right, anything else before we dismiss? All right, we'll turn it back over to Jeff. All right, we're going to sing the chorus of Because He Lives, which is hymn number four of seven. 